course, continuing a series of studies we're doing that we're calling the Apocalypse in Space and Time. It's a survey, really, for the most part, of how the book of Revelation has been understood through history. And I'm just going to give you a heads up this morning. What I say to you this morning may be a little bit shocking, especially if you're not familiar with the chapter of church history that we're going to be treating, which is really the Reformation era, at which time you can imagine there was a huge amount of antipathy among the Reformed folks toward the Catholic Church and especially toward the Pope. And that becomes part of the story, of course, as we think about how the book of Revelation has been construed. So just a heads up, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just trying to report the facts like Joe Friday here. So we'll uh, uh, just stay with the story as best we can. But we started, you recall, back in the first century, just trying to ask what's the likely setting in which Revelation came? I think the best theory, and I've told you this already, is that it would have been during the reign of Nero. The whole question of the date is one we'll return to at a later time. I'm hoping we'll have time for that and look at it maybe in a little bit more detail. But for now, I'm just making that assumption. I've given you some of the rationale for it already. The uh, book was written to particular people at a particular time, and we've talked somewhat about that. However, by the second century, with the fairly intense persecution that was going on against Christian people during the most of the second century, sporadic to be sure, but nevertheless intense at times, many Christian people remembered that Jewish expectation that Messiah would come in a great moment of vindication and rescue in a sense, and that was part of what was in the minds of Christian people. So it gave rise to what was called Chileism. C-H-I-L-A something or other there, Chileism. And that was the view from the Latin word kilo or thousand, it was the idea that the Messiah would come and reign for a thousand years. And that view was fairly conspicuous, maybe even dominant during those years. But by the time we reached the third century, and especially the fourth century, that whole Chileistic view had pretty much passed from the scene and you'd be hard pressed to find anybody by the fourth century that was still holding on to that. In my opinion, part of the reason for that is because the church was becoming increasingly acceptable. It hadn't even become legal yet, but it had made such inroads into all levels of Roman society that it became almost impossible to keep this united assault going on against the Christian faith until finally Constantine threw in the towel and made Christianity at least a legal religion and eventually the official religion. It was after Constantine that we have Augustine who takes the view that the bulk of Revelation should be understood in the context of first century events. But his great contribution was with respect to chapter 20, which he understood as describing not a future millennium, but the present age in which Christian people are now working out their faith and the life of the church is increasingly developing and spreading itself around the world. And so we looked at that last week in something of a panic. I apologize for how rapidly we had to go through that, but nevertheless, that was his contribution, and that became the prevailing view absolutely for a thousand years, all the way through Thomas Aquinas, all through this period that was disparagingly called the Dark Ages, but really was a time of tremendous growth in which brave Christian missionaries, mostly monks, went out to various, very uh, scary places preaching the gospel. Some of them paid for their courage with their lives. But on the whole, there was a gradual pacifying of these bloodthirsty barbarians in northern Europe and elsewhere. The old saying I've heard that maybe you have too is that by the year 1000, the Vikings had stopped raiding and started trading. You know, the effects of the gospel had brought about a new vision of what it is to be civilized. And it's not simply shedding somebody's blood and showing how tough you are. That's the church. That's the Christian gospel that's having that effect. And in many ways, it was Augustine's inspiration that the church would bind Satan based on the work of Christ, throw him back into the abyss, 
drive him into the shadows and turn on the lights so that people begin treating each other with civility and dignity in the spirit of the effects of the gospel. So that really is kind of the story, but things are beginning to change by the time we get to the period of Thomas Aquinas. Even though he follows Augustine, there's a kind of rising new vision that is in some ways related to the <clears throat> condition of the church. And it's that chapter I'd like to take up this morning. I was mentioning to you last week that if you read straight through, which I know you all have now, you're obedient students, and I see the look of confidence on your faces. You've read Revelation now several times, straight through, and you have noticed, as I was trying to remind you last week, that the book has a flavor of worship to it. There's a lot in Revelation that's confusing. Let's just get that on the table, you know. But all the way through the book, peppered here and there, are little psalms, little chorales, little moments in which the expression of worship is perfectly lucid and clear, no ambiguity whatsoever. And if you'll hang on to those as you're kind of on this uh, rapids, you know, of the book, you'll find that it does give you some moorings. It's that worship, that sense of a great service of worship that really ties the whole book together and lets us know that nothing is spinning out of control. Last week we looked briefly at chapter 4, where John is transported into a heavenly sanctuary. He sees there a throne with a sovereign God manifestly present on that throne. Surrounding the throne, John says, are 24 other thrones. 24, of course, significant because it's 12 from the Old Testament plus 12 from the New. 12 tribes, 12 apostles. We're virtually told that explicitly later in the book, that this stands for the people of God throughout history, one great family of faith, united and the symbol of that is the 24 elders worshiping on behalf of all of us. Then we hear that there are seven lamps blazing, reminding us of that seven branched lampstand in the tabernacle of the Old Testament, but now seven separate lampstands saying that now the gospel goes to the world. There's a spirit moving that goes out. We don't go to the tabernacle, the tabernacle goes to the world, you see. We hear that there's a sea of glass as clear as crystal. The, go, the laver that was there in front of the tabernacle is presumably being alluded to. We hear there's four creatures. Katisma is the Greek word. Creation, standing for the creation. So that all of creation celebrates together holy, holy, holy. This is a service of worship. And then John's attention is arrested by a detail in this setting of worship. And he says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, but sealed with seven seals. And I heard a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of all the saints. And they sang a new song, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain 
And with your blood you have purchased men for God from every nation, tribe, language, and people. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. Then I heard the voice of every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped the Word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for this great song of praise to the one, the only one, who is exclusively worthy, who has the right and the, the authority to unravel life's deepest mystery, a scroll that seemed hidden, mysterious, concealed, perplexing, unraveled by this one who is the Lamb, Lion, King of the universe. And we give you thanks that it's in his name that we meet this morning. And we pray that all that we do would be to his honor. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we looked at Augustine of Hippo, and I just mentioned to you the view that he put in place continued through the time of Thomas Aquinas, the next great, really great thinker in the history of the church. But... By the time of Thomas Aquinas, who lives in the 13th century AD, there is something changing. Something is happening in the church, which is beginning to affect how people perceive it. Especially the upper leadership of the church is losing its moral focus and to some degree, therefore, its moral capital. This really began in the 1100s when Urban II, the Pope, authorized the first crusade. It was in 1095, you recall, and the crusade traveled off in 1099, just at the turn of that century. It had actually begun some years earlier. Under Pippin the Short, the father of Charlemagne, the Pope, who had just been rescued by Pippin from the Lombards, was given a kind of protected buffer state. It came to be called the Papal States. And Pippin the Short, in a sense, made the Pope a king. Now at the time, it seemed like an astute thing to do. But it did begin a sort of development in the history of the church that had a certain trajectory by which the Pope would less and less have moral authority and more and more have political authority, because now the Pope is another king, and eventually he has an army, and eventually he goes to battle and fights wars and aligns with some kings and takes hostile positions towards others, and so you have a mixture of a political authority and a religious authority, and of course it didn't take long, it took a couple of hundred years, I'll say that, maybe it wouldn't happen that fast, but by the time we get down to the era we're looking at now, the Pope had actually occasionally with a straight face claimed to not only be a king, but the king, the king of kings on earth, which did tend to rile up other political people in the world a little bit, you see, because he could play the trump card, I'm the Pope. And that makes me a special kind of king. So by the time we get to the beginning of the Crusades, we're hearing that kind of rhetoric out of the Pope. And people are starting to wonder, hmm, what is this exactly? You see, so even now it's happening. By the time we get to the 1200s, the Pope in the midst of the Crusades had become vastly more wealthy. The Crusades were a great money-making operation. 
especially for Italy. It drove the beginnings of the Renaissance. This flow of revenue into Italy especially and Europe in general, and the Pope was right at the middle of it, enjoying the wealth and the revenue that were coming. Then things got even worse during what's called the Avignon Papacy. If you know church history, you know that in the 1300s for about 70 years, the Pope was actually not in Rome, but in France, in a little region called Avignon. This was sometimes called the Babylonian captivity of the papacy, because for 70 years, there's the Pope. Well, that happens to be the time in which the King of France is carrying on a protracted conflict with the King of England known as the Hundred Years' War. And during the Hundred Years' War, the Pope is in the back pocket of the French King and begins to be viewed by people generally, especially the English, as a French lackey. And so now the Pope, rather than having this great moral prestige, is just becoming a pawn of the politics of Europe. And that didn't do much for the respect that was flowing to the Pope. And then to make matters even worse, by the time we get to the late 1300s and 1400s, and the end of the Hundred Years' War, you recall Joan of Arc was a player at that moment, but as the Hundred Years' War comes to a conclusion, a Pope moves back to Rome and another guy stays in Avignon and claims to be the true Pope. And now you've got two Popes both claiming to be the true pope, both treating each other to anathemas, both calling each other the Antichrist, and both declaring that the other one is, you know, some great wicked schemer. Well, Roman Catholic people, good-hearted folks in the world, were going, what is up with this? And then just about the time we get to the 1400s, a third pope comes along. And now you've got three popes all calling each other names. Well, you can imagine that the high prestige the Pope had enjoyed back hundreds of years earlier was now virtually destroyed. And people who were noticing that were also noticing that the Pope with this increasing political power was using it in an increasingly violent and bullying way. So the dissidents of any kind in the church could be burned at the stake, could be executed in the most horrific ways, could be subjected to inquisi inquisitorial techniques that were ghastly and horrible. And now the church is not looking like the church much at all. And it just creates a malaise, a lack of confidence across Europe with respect. This is, as you probably are well aware, the force that really drove the Reformation. Had it not been for this dissolution, Within the upper leadership of the church, it's very likely the Reformation would look very different, you see. But this is what generates that hostility toward the church. All right, that's what's going on over a few hundred years. Well, this gave rise, interestingly, to a new idea about the book of Revelation. Because much of what was happening in the church appeared to resemble some of these colorful descriptions that we find in Revelation. And the interpretive scheme that was brought to the book came to be called the historicist view. It seems to have originated with a guy whose name was Joachim of Fiorde. Joachim was a man of tremendous influence in his day. He was a faithful son of the church. He went to the Holy Land in one of the Crusades, the one organized actually by Bernard of Clairvaux, the Second Crusade, which was less of a military expedition and more of a pilgrimage. It had a kind of military feel to it, but nevertheless it was under Bernard's influence, more of a kind of holy pilgrimage to the Holy Lands after the evident successes of the First Crusade. And while Joachim was there in the Holy Land, he had a bit of an epiphany. His epiphany was that all of human history is divided up into three great chapters, the chapter of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The chapter of the Father began at creation and continued to the time of Christ. The chapter of the Son began with the time of Christ and continued generally to the era in which Joachim himself was living and the chapter of the Holy Spirit would be inaugurated sometime soon, vis-a-vis -vis the life of Joachim himself. 
He predicted, in fact, that this new age of the Holy Spirit would start in the year 1260. This would be after he himself was dead, but that was what he was predicting. This had a huge impact. He was a highly respected guy. Well, you know, whether you've heard of him or not at the time, everybody was familiar with him. Richard the Lionheart, who was the leader of the Third Crusade, actually sat down and had lengthy conversations with Joachim because Richard wondered whether he himself might be the catalyst by which this new era of the Holy Spirit would come into play and that maybe the Third Crusade would be the very event that would trigger it. You see, that's the kind of influence that Joachim had. Well, this particular approach to history gave rise to a different view of the book of Revelation, and he, in fact, developed this to some degree himself. He claimed that when you read the book of Revelation and you come across a reference to 1,260 days or three and a half years, or 42 months, you'll find all of those references in Revelation, that the days are to be construed as years. And this came to be called the day-year theory. So it makes the entire predictive nature of Revelation extend well into the future, over what amounts to maybe hundreds of years and eventually thousands of years. He believed that Revelation was therefore describing events of Western history beginning with the time of the apostles and continuing generally to the present for the life of Joachim. He saw Revelation as pointing originally to pagan Rome, but now sort of incorporating this unhappy condition of the church and that some of the more colorful images in Revelation had the church in mind. Now, he was pretty polite in the way he put this. He is a Roman Catholic, after all, so it is somewhat tentative on his part, but he is kind of floating that trial balloon a little bit. The people that picked up his theory were the Franciscans. You recall that Francis of Assisi wanted to start a new order of monks. He went to the Pope. The Pope said no. And then the Pope was sort of coerced into it by a bad dream he had that night. And so he came back and sort of grudgingly gave the sanction for this new order of monks, the Franciscans. But the Franciscans had always had a rather difficult, tense relationship with the papacy. They didn't look like normal monks. Normal monks, you see, go to the monastery. The Franciscans went out of the monastery, into the streets, into the highways, into the byways. They took ministry out to the people, bless their hearts. They were a wonderful expression of the real spirit, in my opinion, of Christian ministry. But the leadership of the church viewed them with a high degree of suspicion, and they were always a little bit outliers in that. And so this view that had been developed by Joachim became rather appealing to the Franciscans, and they began to develop. This isn't Francis himself, by the way. He's gone by now, but the Franciscan order, at least some of them, began to pick up this idea. And from them, it went to a guy named Nicholas of Lyra. Nicholas of Lyra, again, was a remarkably influential Bible scholar during his era. He is regarded by some as the most influential Bible exegete of that entire era. He was born Jewish. He converted to the Catholic faith as a young adult. He entered the Franciscan order in 1291. He became a doctor at Sorbonne and eventually became the head of all of the Franciscans in France in the year 1319. And he was deeply affected by this view that had originated with Joachim. He wrote a commentary on the whole Bible it was not published because they didn't have a Gutenberg press yet. But, a little church history trivia, the first complete commentary on the Bible ever printed on a Gutenberg press was the one written by Nicholas of Lyra about 100 years after he died. So his work was quite important, quite influential. The style of the commentary was that each page of the Bible was an inset in a broader page of notes. So if you can see that, you see the little inset in the middle there is the Bible text. All of the surrounding material is in fact his commentary on the content of the scripture. 
One of the things that he did, which was much to his credit, and I'm going to try not to be overly technical, but I'll just give you the idea. He insisted that the right way to read the Bible is by giving it the plain sense interpretation. That is, what is the plain sense of the text, the literal sense? What's the plain meaning of the text? This was quite revolutionary, it may surprise you to hear, but at the time, at that time in church history, the most widely accepted sort of hermeneutical strategy was called the quadriga, in which every text of scripture had four separate meanings. Literal, allegorical, tropological, anagogical, All of these meanings, I mean, can you imagine reading a verse of the Bible and thinking there's four separate meanings here? And that became rather a disincentive for folks to try to read the Bible because, hey, who can figure that out? You've got to have all kinds of, you know, sort of advanced degrees and training and so on. Nicholas of Lyra, to his credit, said, wait a minute. The main meaning of the text is the plain sense of the text. And in that sense... He was saying something quite out of sync with what the upper echelon of biblical scholarship was arguing at the time. Nicholas himself went out of his way to insist that he was not being a rebel because some of what he said could have been construed that way. The plain sense of the text actually in many ways was part of what drove the Reformation eventually, you see. Martin Luther, indebted to um, uh, Nicholas. Nicholas himself always insisted his loyalty. He said, for example, quote, I protest that I do not intend to assert or determine anything that has not been manifestly determined by sacred scripture or by the authority of the church. Wherefore, I submit all I have said or shall say to the correction of Holy Mother Church and of all learned men. So he's trying to be faithful to the church, but still his approach to the Bible is the beginning of an entirely new understanding of how the Bible should be uh, understood by Christian people. His influence was widespread. His reliance on scholarly sources, rabbinic commentaries on the Old Testament, Thomas Aquinas was a source of his made his commentary the most widely consulted manual of exegesis until the 16th century. Martin Luther acknowledges his debt to Nicholas when he does lectures on the Old Testament. I say all of this about Nicholas because here's the little strange detail. Even though he insisted on this plain sense approach to the Bible broadly, somehow he drank some Kool-Aid somewhere when it came to Revelation. He had picked up from his Franciscan influence, going back to Joachim, this historicist approach. And so even though everywhere else the rule of plain sense applied, here in Revelation, he sort of suspended those rules. And in fact, viewed Revelation as a prediction, a continuous description in apocalyptic categories of the events of history. He said it began with the apostolic age, would continue until the final consummation, He said, for example, the seals that are broken by Christ, I alluded to those in the recitation earlier, the seven seals, you know. He said, those seals described in Revelation 6 cover the period from the age of Domitian, that uh, emperor of the late first century. In Revelation, he saw in other parts of it the rise of the heresy known as Arianism. He saw the spread of Islam. He saw the reign of Charlemagne. He saw the Crusades and other events, all of them in Revelation. That's the, car, that's the heart of the historicist view, seeing kind of the great play of events in Western history symbolized in the book of Revelation. This became highly influential because Yoach, or, uh, Nicholas was held in such high regard Because his biblical scholarship was so good elsewhere, it was not difficult to sort of embrace, maybe slightly uncritically, what he had done with Revelation. His capital credibility was so 
pronounced on other places that in a sense, this approach to Revelation sneaked in and it became the view of John Wycliffe. It became the view of uh, Martin Luther. It became the view of Isaac Newton and a bunch of other names that you would recognize. It became the prevailing view during the Protestant Reformation. Just a couple of other folks that I'll just mention in passing. You may recall Peter Waldo. He's actually a contemporary of uh, Joachim, the original guy. He's sometimes called the first glimmer, you know, of the Reformation. He criticized the church. He also read the Bible and kind of adopted this plain sense approach, and that led him to be highly critical of the church and in fact to go so far as, and I believe he's the first guy in history to actually say this publicly, to say that the Pope is the Antichrist of the New Testament. That that's what the New Testament was predicting was the rise of this corrupted papacy. Of course, Peter Waldo had some good practical reason for saying that because the church was doing everything it could to catch him and burn him at the stake and many of his followers were executed by uh, papal authority uh, in the ensuing generations. But anyway, he's probably the first. Maybe a guy you, you're more familiar with is John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe, who was active in England during the Hundred Years' War, writes a stream of pamphlets and tracts and other publications essentially arguing the same proposition. He's a couple of hundred years later, and at least among the English, it got a pretty ready acceptance. Here's the Pope who's supporting the French, who's the, who were the bad guys in the Hundred Years' War. They began to think, yeah, there's something to this Pope is the Antichrist business, and so Wycliffe also was important in that connection. A Roman Catholic who took the same view was Irolamo Savonarola. You know his name, he was an important moral reformer in Florence during the high renaissance. He preached a series of highly influential sermons on Revelation, taking a kind of historicist approach. He actually said, point blank, that the church was the harlot of the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and so on. He also said that, well, I won't say this, he came within a hair's breadth to my knowledge, of saying that the Pope was the Antichrist. So at the time when the papal authority has really descended to maybe its most dramatic nadir in history, you can almost imagine that people are reading the Bible and seeing there this corrupted institution reflected in the various descriptions that we find in Revelation and elsewhere. Well, of course, by the time we get to the Reformation, this thing had picked up a life of its own. There was a strong desire to see Revelation as an anti-Roman Catholic polemic. In the New Testament we have three notorious characters. One is known as the beast, that's Revelation. One is known as the man of sin, that's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Apostle Paul. The third is the Antichrist. Antichrist is never mentioned by that name in Revelation. But John, in 1st and 2nd John, alludes to a character known as Antichrist. There was a strong tendency to see all three of these as the same person, and all of them pointing to the Pope. The rise and fall of the Antichrist, as described in the New Testament, was then construed to be a description apocalyptically of the rise and fall of the papacy, which was part of what was inspiring, of course, the Reformation efforts of Luther and others. The images in Western Western civilization, I'm sorry, I should say the images in Revelation, because they were the context for the Antichrist, became descriptions of events in Western history that surrounded the papacy. So again, it seemed to fit the kind of uh, impulse for interpretive imagination that was going on. Martin Luther himself, interestingly, had a very tentative view of Revelation. In his preface to the book and his translation of the New Testament, he writes this. He says, quote, about this book, Revelation, I leave everyone free to hold his own opinions. I would not have anyone bound by my opinion or judgment. I say what I feel. I miss more than one thing in this book, and it makes me consider it to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. 
So not only did Luther have questions about the book of James, he had serious questions about the book of Revelation. He especially disliked all of the images, the colorful pictures and apocalyptic uh, kind of uh, descriptions that we find there. He said this, quote, First and foremost, the apostles do not deal with visions, but prophesy in clear and plain words, as do Peter and Paul and Christ in the gospel. For it befits the apostolic office to speak clearly of Christ and his deeds without images and visions. Moreover, there is no prophet in the Old Testament to say nothing of the new who deals so exclusively with visions and images. For myself, I think it approximates the fourth book of Esdras. I can in no way detect that the Holy Spirit produced it. Esdras was a Jewish apocalyptic writing that was very popular in the first century, came out of the Hellenistic era, and it was given to a lot of fanciful descriptions. Luther think it has, has more in common with Esdras than the Bible. He criticized the extravagant claims of the author of Revelation. He said, you know, who's this guy saying, if you subtract one word from this prophecy, God's going to subtract to you all the blessings that are described herein and so on. He just thinks it's too extravagant, too over the top. Luther, however, finally left it to individual judgment. He said, finally, let everyone think of it as his own spirit leads him. My spirit cannot accommodate itself to this book. For me, this is reason enough not to think highly of it. Christ is neither taught nor known in it. I have to wonder, did he ever read it? But that's just different. I like Luther. You know that, don't you? He's one of my heroes, so it pains me to have to give you this. I'd like to spin it a little bit, but no, just the unvarnished uh, facts here. But to teach Christ, Luther continues, this is the thing which an apostle is bound above all else to do, as Christ says in Acts, you shall be my witnesses. Therefore, I stick to the books that present Christ to me most clearly and purely. So Luther himself holds Revelation in some degree of tension, not really supporting it, as you can tell, very uh, aggressively. Nevertheless, and this is a little bit of a almost duplicity in Luther. When it comes to the Pope, he's perfectly prepared to see in Revelation and elsewhere allusions to the Pope. And he did indeed in some ways apply descriptions in Revelation to his own time. This is not Luther now. This is a church historian not sympathetic to Luther named Dobon, who wrote a history of the Reformation. But I think his, this quote is pretty telling. I think it's accurate at least, uh, if not a little bit stylized, but listen to it. This is uh, uh, Dubon for, uh, on Luther. Quote, Luther proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John, by the epistles of St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. Jude, that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy. And all the people did say, amen. A holy terror seized their souls. It was Antichrist whom they beheld seated on the pontifical throne. This new idea, which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther into the midst of his contemporaries, inflicted the most serious blow on Rome. This was quite a psychological uh, notion to begin spreading. This is the guy we read of in the Bible, and people came to believe it, and in some ways Luther and others were encouraging that. It's no problem finding in Luther's writings, uh, he made many, on many occasions, statements like this one, which is uh, very early. He says, we here are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. He said that August 18th, 1520, in a writing called The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers. And as I say, this became the dominant view during the Reformation. This almost became one of the fundamental articles of faith during the Reformation. And again, if you've never heard this before, it may be a little shocking to you to hear it. I know some of you are already familiar with this, some of you may not be, but uh, this is a very significant chapter of church history, and it is uh, an interesting, uh, as I think, an interesting illustration once again of what I'm calling the chameleon character of the book of Revelation, that it does tend to shift its content based on the fundamental concerns of the time. And it's that that I'm hoping eventually we can try to escape, although I'm not going to try to give us an escape hatch yet. 
John Calvin is the one notable exception in this whole description. John Calvin never wrote a commentary on Revelation. He wrote a commentary on most of the Bible. In fact, he only didn't, he only skipped about three books. One of them was Revelation. Some people thought the reason he didn't write a commentary on Revelation was because he doubted its canonicity. I don't think so. Nothing he ever said raised the kind of red flags that you find in Luther. I think he accepted it as canonical. He's reported to have said on one occasion the reason he didn't write a commentary on Revelation was because the ground was too holy to tread upon. I don't know if that was just tongue in cheek or what, but in any event, he believed, and the little scant evidence we have of John Calvin's view of Revelation, he believed with Augustine the apocalyptic imagery applied to first century events. It was written for that population at that time in history to describe what they were going through. And so it doesn't seem, there's no evidence that I'm aware of at all in Calvin that he saw in Revelation some sort of historicist approach. But having said that, he allowed that Revelation include his, includes principles of instruction for every age. Once we've properly interpreted, we're perfectly legitimate in applying the encouragements of the book to our own age. When we are persecuted, we can find comfort in it. But maybe more importantly, Calvin didn't shrink a bit from joining in the chorus during the Reformation, declaring that the Pope was the Antichrist. Not based on Revelation, however, but based on Paul's descriptions in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So Calvin, for example, says, quote, some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. And that, of course, is not Revelation, that's 2 Thessalonians. Calvin continues, I shall briefly show that the words of Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. So again, even though Calvin had a different view of Revelation, he did not have a different view with respect to the papacy. All right, just a few others, just for fun. If this is fun, John Knox, I won't actually quote from him. You know, he's the founder of the... Uh, Presbyterian Church in Scotland, uh, you can imagine this firebrand of a preacher had no problem attaching uh, the uh, idea of Antichrist to the papacy. Thomas Cramner, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury under Henry VIII, no problem assigning the status of Antichrist to the uh, papacy. It may surprise you to hear that Roger Williams, usually credited as being the great man of religious toleration, Rhode Island, the place where there'd be religious freedom, had no problem assigning the status of Antichrist to the Pope. This is a quote from Roger Williams uh, regarding the Pope as, quote, the pretended vicar of Christ on earth who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but over the souls and consciences of all his vassals, yea, over the Spirit of Christ, over the Holy Spirit, yea, and God himself speaking against the God of heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition. He says that in a commentary on 2 Thessalonians 2, the prophetic faith uh, quoted in a book called The Prophetic Faith of Our Father. So Roger Williams joined the chorus as well. The Westminster Confession of Faith, 1647 edition, quote, there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition that exalts himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, I read the Westminster Confession, I don't remember that. It's in the footnote because it was edited out later as later thinkers reflecting on this believe maybe too many folks were getting carried away on this point and at this point I'm simply reporting this to you because I want to impress you that it was at the time taken for granted you see that the Pope was indeed the Antichrist of the Bible the Puritans who come after the Reformers had the very same view. Cotton Mather, you may know his name. He was a highly influential Puritan in the uh, colonial period. John Wesley is not a Puritan exactly, but he lived at that time. 
He was the founder, as you know, of the Methodist Church. John Wesley says this, quote, he, referring to the Pope, in an emphatical sense, the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure. And he is too properly styled the son of perdition, as he's caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and followers. It is he that exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, claiming the highest power, the highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone. Jonathan Edwards uh, shares the view. Uh, he agreed with the general Puritan assessment of Rome. He agreed with the assessment that the Pope was the Antichrist. He said, quote, the beast is found speaking great things and blasphemies, which Edwards applied to the Pope. He says he arrogates to himself the power and prerogatives of God and pretends the same power of the church as Christ has. He, believed, he taught in his commentary on Revelation that the Roman church was the great harlot. He mocked the, the purported miracles of the Pope. I'm going to move along a little bit because of time. Uh, he affirmed, however, in history, the ultimate victory of the true church, and he worked out what's come to be called a sweeping post-millennial eschatology. I'm not going to treat that now, but when we return two weeks from today, next week is Easter. By the way, happy Palm Sunday. Praise God. Two weeks from now is Easter. Well, I want to do a little bit on Edward's view of that post-millennial uh, idea. All right. Ellen G. White, 18th century, I'm sorry, 19th century, 1800s, adopts the historicist view. She's the founder of the Seventh-day Adventists. It continues to be the Seventh-day Adventist view of the book of Revelation to this day. Uh, others, many others, during this era of the 1800s, took the same view, just by way of a sampling. Uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just doing this so you get a feel for uh, where this was now by the time we get to the 1800s. One very influential Bible commentator named Edward Bishop Eliot wrote a highly influential treatment of Revelation titled Horae Apocalyptice. He said, the trumpets of Revelation cover from A.D. 395 to A.D. 1453. He said the first trumpet was the invasion by the Goths. The second trumpet was the invasion under Gennesaret. The third trumpet was Attila the Hun. The fourth trumpet was the collapse of Rome in 476. The fifth trumpet were the Muslim hordes, as he called them, the locusts that come out of the abyss in Revelation chapter 9. The sixth trumpet, the four angels that are holding back uh, the forces of destruction at the great river Euphrates is referring to the rise of Turkish power in the Ottoman Empire. You see, this is the kind of thing that was just freewheeling and going on all the time in this particular interpretive scheme. And just by the way, some others that may be of interest. Many viewed monks and friars as the locusts of Revelation chapter 9. Mohammed was viewed as the fallen star of Revelation 9. Elizabeth I was construed by some to be the first bowl of Revelation 16. Martin Luther was called by some the angel of the church at Sardis, Revelation chapter 3. Adolf Hitler in the 20th century in this scheme was called the red horse of uh, Revelation chapter 6. What's the problem with this? I'm going to give you three thoughts. I haven't, I've tried not to be too critical of the views as we've been, you know, covering them, but here I can't resist it. Uh, so I've got to say a couple of words just uh, as we wrap this up. Aside, aside from the problem, that if the historicist view of Revelation is correct, it would have made the book absolutely nonsensical and irrelevant and worthless to the original recipients of it, aside from that problem. I see some other little details that trouble me about the historicist view. First, the book of Revelation, if you read it, which you all have, seems to describe events taking place clustered in a relatively brief period of time. And it does raise a question how this description that at least on the face of it seems to happen in a brief period of time all of a sudden stretches out over centuries and indeed millennia. How does that happen? Well, the theory that went clear back to Joachim, bless his heart, 
has done service. This was the view taken by Ellen G. White of the Seventh-day Adventists and most historicists to this day, who were still out there, by the way, take this kind of year-day theory. Days in the book of Revelation are actually years. And actually, there's more horsepower for this because it allows, of course, for this kind of protracted uh, understanding of Roman Catholic history, which, by the way, would be part of Seventh-day Adventist teaching to this day. It also got additional juice from the book of Daniel, which talks about 2,300 days. And so now we've got 2,300 years to play with in this view. So that's the first problem. The first problem is that for no hermeneutically legitimate reason that's at least obvious, days are turned into years. So that, now, that's not without precedent. And in the book of Daniel, you have weeks of years, so maybe there's some justification for it, but that's one problem. I'd say a more deep problem is that historicist interpreters have been unable to date to ever establish an objective criterion by which the book is to be understood. So it basically requires that Revelation be interpreted in light of external events so that external events are used to interpret the book rather than the other way around. That's always a dangerous approach to hermeneutics. It also, I think you probably suspect, closes the book of Revelation to any ordinary reader. I mean, you've got to be pretty up to speed on a lot of details in history if you're going to take this view. It makes you dependent, in a sense, on purported Christian teachers who are going to put all of that together for you. But the ordinary reader of Revelation would be more or less unable to make heads or tails of it. One commentator, John Hendrick de Vries, said, quote, it turns exegesis into an artful play of ingenuity. And I think there's some truth to that. Finally, it creates a kind of agenda-driven hermeneutics. Revelation becomes the vehicle by which, it seems to me, the biases of the interpreter simply get a kind of biblical legitimacy. So I use Revelation to buttress what is actually my own private opinion on this or that topic. Now that happens all the time, but it does seem this approach to Revelation gives a certain freewheeling power to that that might not be quite so readily available elsewhere. Revelation becomes a kind of provincial book. Invariably, the historicist approach sees Revelation describing Western history. We don't hear much about the East, we don't hear much about, the, you know, Africa, we don't hear much about the rest of the world. It's Western history that becomes the centerpiece of descriptions from Revelation. The interpretive scheme has to be reworked. Every time a new generation comes along with new Western history to deal with, we have to redo Revelation. All of these things, to me, suggest that the jury is out, it has come in and found this view wanting. So if you don't mind me saying, I think that this view, even though some of the people I respect the very most, I mean, I love Martin Luther, you know, I like John Calvin, I like all these people, uh, and I'm leaving Calvin out, this was not his treatment of Revelation, but even the uh, rather uh, vociferous and uh, vitriolic statements about the Pope, I think are a little bit overstated, in my opinion, for whatever it's worth, you may differ. But uh, nevertheless, uh, that's where it is. I reminded you at the beginning, we'll wrap up with this, my Sunday school lesson of a scroll. It was mysterious. Nobody could look inside it. Nobody could figure out. Some people think the scroll of Revelation 5 and 6 is the book of Revelation. Maybe so. I don't think so. But one thing it stands, whatever else it stands for, it stands for this. There is a fundamental explanation of things that is hidden from us without the help of the one who is worthy. What history is about, what it actually is disclosing, what story it is telling, has been the subject of countless comment by countless thinkers, but there's only one, my friends, who is worthy. There's only one who can break the seals, open the scroll, and tell us what it's about. And if that's true of human history, it is also true of your history. There is a sense in which in every one of our lives there is a scroll that is hidden, sealed with seven seals. What is my life about? If you've been sleeping for the last 45, 50 minutes, wake up. What is your life about? What is the story? What is in that scroll? 
There's only one who is worthy to open the scroll and to make the sense of your life make sense to you. And you're not that person. You are not worthy. Only Christ can break the seals, open the scroll, and tell you this is what your life really means. So, now I know in here I'm preaching to the choir. God bless you all. But you know people who are twisting in the wind, wondering, what's my life about? That scroll remains sealed. There is one who is worthy to open that scroll and give light in a world where there's confusion and hopelessness and despair and suicide and horrific self-destruction of every, every conceivable, imaginable kind. There's a scroll which can be opened. Let us all, with the humility of God's Spirit in us, help in our own lives and in others, help see that scroll opened by the one who is worthy.